the story I'm going to tell you is one in which um, it's, it refers to Turning Point. And just so, so that you know, Turning Point is we are really are inspired by possibility. We operate in 240 odd locations. We employ, well, near as damn it, 4,000 staff. The turnover this year will be 130 million. We work across mental health, learning disabilities, substance misuse, some primary care stuff. We're interested in reversing the inverse care law. Um, I love what I do, that's why I've done it for 15 years. Um, and, um, but, or and, but. I'm in one of our substance misuse services uh, a few months ago. And this chap, chap walks in and he's, he's coughing. And, um, and he's got a substance misuse problem. Duh, that's why he's there, I guess. And um, we, in our services, I mean, some of, you, some of you will work with people with substance misuse challenges, won't you? Yes? And in most communities, they're some of the illest people walking. Would you agree with me? You know, they're the illest people, you know, like, next one down, you, you are in hospital. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So this guy's coughing. He's got a bit of a cough. And we employ um, GPs. I'm, I'm not sure I'm allowed to call them GPs, but they've gone to medical school and they're the smartest people in the room, you know, better ear levels than me and all that sort of stuff. And, you know, they are. So we've got these specialists. And I see one of them and I say, oh, you know, this chap's coughing and he looks rough. You know, what do you think's wrong with him? You know, other than the fact that he's got, you know, a substance misuse challenge. And um, the doc listens and says, um, I probably got bronchitis. And I, I say, oh, that's great, you know, in a way. You know, he's come here with his substance misuse challenge, his, his cough, and, you know, probably going to prescribe something. I said, what, what are you going to, you know, antibiotics. That's the thing, isn't it, that you prescribe for bronchitis these days? Our clinician said, um, well, we can't, really. We can't do that. So why not? Well, we haven't got a contract to prescribe antib antibiotics. I said, what's going to happen to him then? He said, well, he's probably going to, we're going to send him to his GP. And I said, well, wh what happens if he doesn't go to his GP? So what's the chance of him going to his GP? So about 2%. So he's not going to go to his GP, is he? So what's going to happen then? Well, he's going to get worse, isn't he? So what's going to happen then? I don't, you know, probably going to end up in A&E. I said, how often does this happen? Well, we've got over 2,000 clients, 1,995 times. And I thought, well, that's the opposite of integrated community-based care, isn't it? It's like, that's insane. That is negative value transfer. That, that, what I've just described happening to that individual has got to stop. You know, we could replace him with, I don't know, my mum, who's got complex issues. <laughs> the point being that there should be no wrong door and every service should reverse the inverse care law, which simply states those people in need of health and social care the most, get them the least, right? That's what I mean, right? That's what we should all mean when we talk about, um, well, in my view, the future of the NHS, but person-centered care for vulnerable, vulnerable people and indeed integration, place-based health. It starts there and builds out, which is a problem for the NHS because the NHS is process driven. If you want to, put your hand up if you haven't been in a session, in a meeting with a load of NHS England or, I don't know, CCG people where your thought has been, you know what, what's the intention behind this process? <laughs> you with me? <laughs> right, what's the intention? That should drive the change. For Turning Point, um, you know, I, one of the reasons I accepted this, this, um, this gig is because we work with 776 pharmacies across the UK. So I want to say thank you, frankly, because um, we'd be stuffed without you and so would our clients. <laughs> so, um, you don't hear that very often, do you? Thanks. We have, we have all the panoply, I think, of pushing towards um, 
some of the big shifts in both pharmacy and the delivery of care to vulnerable people. You know, pharmacy is challenged by basically the growth of, and which I think is a good thing, by the way, but I think it's a challenge to the pharmacy business model of the electronic age. You know, what can be done uh, with patients? Um, they're not just passive recipients of a prescription anymore. They're active participants and want to be active participants in their own health, even people who are as <coughs> ill as some of the people that, that Turning Point work with actually don't want to be done to, they want to be done with. But but that is a very big shift, I think, you know, in how we all have to operate, and in particular how pharmacy um, has to operate. You know, the whole panoply of 24-7, you know, electronic prescribing, uh, the work that we're doing with pharmacists to measure and to help us construct conversations with the NHS about who's going to be in and out of their acute care, their A&E, the expensive stuff. <laughs> That's the kind of stuff that we're, um, that we're working with. In doing that, as in doing that, both pharmacy and turning point is actually trying to innovate. You're trying to innovate. So, you know, a lot of people think that if you innovate, what you do is you publish what you, we, we're very good at that. We publish papers and we shove it all out there. You know, do this, do that, best practice, toolkits. <laughs> this stuff falls like snow, lasts about as long, right? The fact of the matter is, um, most innovation works because the people who innovate take over the people who don't. That's how it works, actually. The other myth is that you go through two stages of innovation. You, you practice the new, the new thing, the new toy, the new service, till it's perfect, and then you roll it out. Wrong. You roll it out and practice at the same time. The fact of the matter is, pharmacy operates where people are, you know, in a really real way. You know, people do vote with their feet. People do experience pharmacy, and they actually talk to pharmacies. Pharmacists, probably. This isn't an evidence-based statement. I'm just going to tell you. Right? I think they're more comfortable talking to their pharmacists in many cases than they are talking to their GP. I certainly think it's the case. It's true of my. It could be that I've just got a nice pharmacist and not a very nice chief. I don't know. <laughs> but I just think there's that notion that we could be learning in situ, real, real time, what works, building qualitative and quantitative evidence, and actually innovating and showing the system what, <coughs> what it could be. My point is that pharmacy has a unique position um, in, in its presence in the community and its relationship with, with individuals. Yeah. And I think that you have to ask you the, set yourself the question, honest question, why aren't we more influential in the policy? Why haven't we? And it's a difficult question to ask yourself. But how can we show the NHS? How can we present them with a vision, a practical, um, gr ground-up vision of what integrated community um, health and social care services could be. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.